come July 15th of 1964, I, I turned 21, and the next day I packed my bags and went to Mississippi. I felt that I had always been brought up as part of my Jewish upbringing that Jews are not safe unless, you know, are, unless everybody's safe. Jews are not free unless everybody else are free because, because you know, they'll come for them and then they'll come for us. I mean, you, most likely, even if it didn't, you'd have to assume that. And also, it's right. It's that simple. It's the right way to do things. You know, there should be nobody who's subjugated. Nobody, if I can vote, you should vote. If I live comfortably, you should live comfortably. That's basically how, how I was brought up. So, come the Civil Rights Movement, there was an opportunity to actually stop talking about it and hopefully do something about it. So I was very happy to have that opportunity. It was that simple. Yeah, I just wanted to help make things better. I was young enough to believe I could do it overnight, you know, and then, you know, a few weeks in Mississippi and the world would change. First of all, it was like nothing I had ever experienced. Nice little middle class upbringing in, in Connecticut, rural Connecticut, and then Boston, you know. The South at that time was another country. I mean, you've heard songs, maybe you haven't, but there were songs about it. Um, it was a third world. I mean, people, there were not indoor, there was not indoor plumbing in a lot of places. African American, you know, black, you know, homes. Many did not have indoor plumbing. Actually, there were white homes that didn't have indoor plumbing as well. Um, the, if that's a touchstone for something, uh, it was segregated. Uh, it was dangerous. The Klan, the white supremacists were fighting for their existence. And so they were lethal. As we later that summer found out, they killed those three boys who had disappeared. Uh, my friend who went down, you know, from Brandeis, he got shot, you know, not where I was, but somewhere else. You know, these people were out for blood. Um, the blacks could not shop in the supermarkets. They could not go to the library. They could not go to the movies, except maybe to sit in the back of the balcony. Um, and it went on and on. I, I, the bookstore thing was particularly, I never could quite come to grips with some of this because I, I wanted to buy some books. I, they, people had sent a lot of books and we were setting up little libraries in these freedom houses where we worked. So uh, we took what we had, and then I thought, well, I have a few books. Let me go buy a couple books, you know. And there was one bookstore in town. And as it turned out, the guy who owned the bookstore was Jewish. I went in there, and he said, I can't sell to you. And I said, I said but you're Jewish. I'm Jewish. He, and he felt really bad, but he said, I have to live here. I have to live here. And you, if I sell you books, I'm in trouble in this town. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I, I really began to understand what it meant. Because here's a man who really would have probably supported us, but for his own safety, he couldn't. Um, so that was that. But um, it, was, it, was, it was difficult. It was very difficult. Um, the food, the only place they could buy food was at like a mom and pop store and the only food they got was stuff that was on the thin edge of going bad. So I learned different ways to cook food to cover up the taste of things, you know, and how to also make things okay. I mean, it was, it was a rough, rough, rough place to be for anyone and particularly if you were born there and black. 